everybody. I'm Pastor Ken Vance, and I'm excited because we began a new series last week called Community by Design. And as I mentioned to you last week, each week it will build, and next week is really, really important. We got a huge announcement in the midst of this. You're going to want to be here. There's something special that we're going to be doing at Vertical Church. So I'm not going to give it away. You need to make uh, a plans. Circle your calendar, come out, you really want to be, because I'm excited about where God's taking us. But in this series, we're going to pick up where we left off last week, because we discovered something. That we were not created to be alone. We were created for community. And God intended that the church would be a community by design. And so today, I want to talk to us about God's dream. Do you know that God has a dream? For every single one of us. For you and me. God has a dream for us. Just like any parent. They have aspirations and desires for their children. Well God is a loving father. Many think that God is just interested about what we do. You know our marriages, our careers or things. But no. God has more than that. He is interested and cares about what we experience. What the type and the quality of life that you and I have. God has dreams. He has aspirations. He has desires for our ultimate fulfillment. And I believe that God's biggest dream is that you and I would experience authentic community. Community that's distinguished by meaningful relationships. That is, that, that that experiences oneness with God and one another. See, God didn't design community just to meet our, our need for emotional security. God didn't meet, he didn't create community just to answer the longing for, you know, to to eradicate loneliness. No, God had something deeper in mind. In fact, listen to me. Community is the reason the universe exists. Community is the reason the universe exists. Listen to this. Dallas Willard, who is a professor and theologian, Dallas Willard said this. God's aim in human history is the creation of an inclusive community of loving persons, with himself included as its primary sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. When you read the Bible from cover to cover, you realize God had a dream, and his dream is ultimately fulfilled. Because when you get a picture of heaven, what you understand is this, that God is in the midst of her. God is all in all. And you and I were designed by God to experience community with him, and with one another. Which is why Jesus taught us to pray that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, if you have a Bible this morning, turn to the book of John, the book of John, chapter 17. I just This is so awesome. It's so encouraging. As you're turning there, listen, the gospel of John, you need a Bible reading, listen, all you have to do, find the New Testament it's the fourth one in. And there, the New Testament starts with four stories of the life of Jesus written by eyewitnesses, written by people that, that were contemporaries to Jesus. And John, Jesus, probably closest human companion on earth. The Apostle John gives us this understanding that at Jesus' most trying moment, Jesus has, listen, a dying request. When you find John 17, what we're about to look at is Jesus' final prayer. Jesus was praying knowing that death was before him, that he was about to die. And so this represents in this prayer Jesus' dying request. And what is it about dying requests? Dying requests are very personal. They represent the things we're most passionate about, and they represent our greatest hopes and dreams for the people that we love, which is why we're always so willing to attempt to meet those if possible. I remember in 2009 when my father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer. In the early, the first couple weeks of February, it was determined that he had cancer in multiple places of his bo- in his body. Now, my father-in-law and I shared a unique relationship. He respected what I did. We got along well, and he wanted to talk to me privately. And in that time, he shared his hopes, his dreams, his desires for my mother-in-law. But one of the things that he said to me is that he wanted my mother-in-law to be able to experience 
seeing Alaska with him. He had had the chance to travel there earlier with a, with a neighbor who had a place out there. And he wanted it. It was so beautiful and so impactful to him. He wanted it. But what happened, unfortunately, you know, I started looking into it. I'm like, you know, because of his illness, we're going to need to take a cruise. There ain't no way we're going to be able to walk around and sit on the deck. But unfortunately, I found out that cruises only happen in Alaska from May and on forward into the summer months. It's too cold in the winter. Well, his cancer progressed. And by March 24th, he went on to heaven. But it was my desire to say, is that possible? Because when we realize people that we love, their dying request represents something so intimate, so personal. This is Jesus' dying request. Look with me. In John chapter 17 and verse 20, Jesus, he said, my prayer is not for them alone. In other words, Jesus had been praying for his closest followers, what his desire was for them, what, God, what he wanted the Father to do in their lives and for them, but he didn't pray for them alone. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. How many believers do I have in this room today? Well, you know, Jesus is praying for you in this prayer. Because all of us, one way or another, we came to faith in Christ through the testimony of the apostles. Because of his closest followers, they recorded the events. They told the story. Others believed because they had seen and heard. They experienced the resurrection and told the life of Christ. And we've come to faith. So Jesus is praying not for them alone. He's praying for us. And what is his prayer? What is his request? Look at verse 21. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Notice this. Jesus is praying that you and I would experience something amazing. Jesus is praying that you and I would experience a quality of relationship with one another, that Jesus had been experiencing for all eternity with the Trinity. Jesus is actually saying, Father, allow them, as you and I have experienced such an intimate and personal unity and oneness in our relationship. That's so fascinating to me. When you read, you said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The word with in Greek, is the word prose. And it literally means to face. It's such an intimate picture of two people looking face to face in closeness, in union, in relationship together. Jesus prayed here again that they would be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus' prayer is that we would experience relationship with God and one another that was like the relationship he had known for all eternity. That's fascinating. That's powerful. That's what God designed you and I to experience. That's God's will. So therefore, you and I need to recognize this. Community was so important to God because before there was anything created, God experienced and had been experiencing for eternity perfect community, perfect fellowship, perfect oneness in the Trinity. So for us to understand community from the heart of God. Because God didn't create man because he was bored. God didn't create man because he was lonely. You know, the ancient ideas of the gods is that, you know, somehow man was just a lackey. They were made for the entertainment of the gods, you know, kind of had to do their dirty work, kind of bring them food and all the rest of this stuff. No, when you get the picture of the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible created man because he wanted him to experience something that God had been experiencing for all eternity. It was so good. God didn't want to keep it to himself. So he created people to share it with. And therefore it is important for you and I to understand community. It is rooted 
in the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity, people will immediately say, well, you know, the word Trinity doesn't exist in the Bible. And the doctrine of the Trinity is one of the most challenging ones for the church sometimes to try to communicate. And people use illustrations and say, you know, the community, uh, uh, the Trinity is like an egg. You know, there's a shell, there's the white, there's the yolk, three in one, you know. Or they say, oh, community is like water. Water can be solid, liquid, or gas. And they come up with all these things. And there are points that are important because when people deny the idea of the Trinity, because, you know, how can God be one and yet three persons? That doesn't make sense. Because intellectually, we're finite. And we're trying to comprehend the infinite of God. But let me tell you this. The Bible says God has clearly revealed himself through the things which he created, which is fascinating to me. Think about this for a moment. What God created was space, time, and matter, right? All the materiality that we in intersect with, that's what science studies, right? Space, time, and matter. Isn't it amazing that it's three? And to each one, time. Time exists in past, present, and future, but it is all just one time, right? To, to a, a space, it, ex, it exists in length, depth, and width, but it's just one space, right? And matter is energy, motion, and phenomena, but it's just one matter, right? In fact, what's the building block of all materiality? It's an atom, right? And when you look at an atom, an atom is made up of neutron, proton, and an electron. And if you look at see, because God's signature is on creation, but people say, well, <laughs> that's typical. I don't, I don't, it's hard to understand, but listen to me. Early church fathers. The first followers of Christ never attempted to explain the Trinity in scientific forms. I believe they have their part. I use that at times, especially when people deny these ends. I say, well, how do you explain creation? It is all over it. God's signature is on everything he created. Even we need water, right? And what's water? Water is H2O, right? It's, it's, it's God in everything God created. It's there, but listen to me. When the early church explained the Trinity, they explained it this way. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three divine persons, one God. The perfect oneness, perfect unity, perfect harmony. Three yet one. So when you attempt to understand community, God has experienced community through all eternity. It is rooted, community is rooted in the very nature of who God is is. God was experiencing it for eternity, and he invited us in. In fact, if you're taking notes, listen. Community is an invitation. Community is an invitation to the fellowship. Now, some of you try to go ahead and fill in before I ever get there, and so the, all of you that filled in, ring, forget it, okay? It is, it is uh, community is an invitation to the fellowship of the Trinity, Okay, not the ring. Okay, all the, all, all the token nerds out there. Okay, listen to me. You and I need to recognize God invited us. That's what community is. God lived in community, invited us to experience the fellowship of the Trinity. That's what it is. Do you ever think about it? What's life like in the Trinity? Have your mind ever gone there? Have you ever thought, what is life like? I mean, do they, do they kind of one-up themselves and say, you know what? No, I'm, a, I'm more omnipotent than you. I'm more omniscient than you. Do they, do, they have, do they ever have like an argument over whose turn is it to take out the garbage? Do they ever have like a disagreement about what's for dinner? Or who, who's going to determine what they're watching? I mean, you think about it. Because why? In the Trinity, there is no bickering. There is no pettiness. There is no selfishness. There is perfect, selfless love of giving. It is absolutely fascinating. In the Trinity, God created out of that end because he wanted others to know because God is love. And the love that God had been experiencing for all eternity with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he could not keep it to himself and created all so that they could experience something with him. Community is in that end. Now, it's hard for us Again, we're thinking about it in terms of God, but when you think about human connection for a moment, because so often our human connections are marred by sin, and therefore we, we have trouble understanding perfect harmony and unity 
because their selfishness tends to hurt. Selfishness tends to mar. But there's something in us that we know it. That's why we desire it. That even when we've been hurt in life, we still look for love because we're hardwired on that end. Now, we can attempt to understand it in simple ways in a human connection form because when you look at the relationship between parents and children in a healthy way, when you look at the love of a mother for her child, when she selflessly gives and serves and the child receives life, you begin to understand life-giving relationships when one pours out themselves into another and there's a receiving, but yet the one that's pouring out doesn't feel drained, but is energized because they have the ability to give and receive love. Now, I remember this. When my son Ryan, just a little over a year old and was talking, my habit every night, I would come home, and if I was late, if I was at meetings, I always went into his room. And one night, I'll never forget this, because it, when, when, it, when it's affected by it, I, would, I looked down into my son's crib, and he just turned, he woke up in that moment, he looked up, and he said, Daddy, I love you. I picked him up in my arms. I, I, was, I almost melted to the floor. But I held him, and there was such a bond, such a union. It was life-giving. In fact, I just went through a birthday recently, and my boys, one of the most meaningful realities, both of my boys in their own way, came and expressed to me in their own words how much they loved me, how much they cared for me, and how much I can't even begin to express how much it meant to me. In fact, my own wife made my birthday so special. Even though I was going through all the rest of this, you know, sorry, life comes. I said to someone on the phone yesterday, whenever you're walking through crap, that's a great time to, to sow seeds because it's great fertilizer. So whenever you've got a, got a lot of stuff going on in life, you need to look at the positive to it. God, you're about to do something fantastic. Otherwise, I wouldn't be walking through all this fertilizer, okay? But those around you, in fact, I remember one of my worst days ever. Because we need others in our lives. We do. I had gone through a very difficult period. Most of you understand, if you don't, I don't mean to blow your head, but I was married before. And I had gone through a round of infidelity with my ex-wife. Well, all of a sudden, I had suspicion that this was going on again. And our relationship began to part. But it was, people can be such good liars that you don't even know. In your head, you're questioning. But in your gut, you know. And so I went to spend time with my friend, and I had hired an investigator. And I'll never forget the moment. I got a call, and it was the investigator. And everything I knew intellectually was true. And now emotionally, I burst. Everything in me, it felt like a dam came down, and my emotions exploded. If I were to try to explain to you, it'd be like my world was a sandcastle. And all of a sudden, a wave came in and tempted to wash it all out. But my best friend is not my best friend for no reason. My best friend held me as I broke and cried and gushed and all of my inner guts were flowing out. But in that time, he assured me that it's gonna be all right. In that moment, he gave me the courage to know because I knew connection. My friend was more life to me than I can begin to understand. We need others. We need one another. You cannot control what life brings your way. But why would we attempt to try to do life alone? That was never the will of God. God doesn't want us in isolation. We need it because there is a life-giving connection. In fact, listen to this. Dr. Larry Crabb, psychologist, he said this. As a Christian clinical psychologist said this. When two people connect, when their beings intersect as closely as two bodies in intercourse, something is poured out of one and into the other that has the power to listen has the power to heal the soul of its deepest wounds and restore it to health. The one who receives and experiences the joy of being healed, the one who gives knows the even greater joy of being used to heal. And he went on to say, something good 
is in the heart of each of God's children that is more powerful than anything bad. It's there waiting to be released to work its magic. That's why God wants us to step out of the shadows. That's why God wants us to connect because there are going to be times when I need you and there's going to be times when you need me. And we need to humble ourselves and admit that's just so. Because the fact is God created us in these ends. And I know some of you question and say, you know, I get it. Because you say, you know, Pastor Ken, you don't realize I've been hurt in life. I don't know if I can trust. Well, I've been there. Trust me. Okay, I grew up in a home. Okay, my mom died when I was eight. My dad and I had no connection. He made me feel like I was nothing. I went into it, my very first girlfriend, you know, yeah, I'm 16 years old. What do I know about love? Okay, but I thought I was in love. And my girlfriend, the one that I finally gave my heart to, left me, didn't even have the courage to tell me and started going out with one of my best friends. Okay, I went through, as you already heard, craziness in marriage. And my, my former predecessor, my, my, my closest friend, my leader for years, I loved him dearly, but we just had this thing where it was difficult. So have you been hurt? Yes, but listen to me. It's still worth it. Because God has some. It's why people can go through the worst divorces in the world and still think about getting married again. Because love has a way of making all things new. And you and I realize that in that end of it, God, when we experience love that comes from God, who heals our inner being, it can't remain in us. It can't stay solitary. When love heals you from the inside out, you got to give it away. You got to connect. You got to. And that's what God designed is that the church would be a community that would be distinguished by love, not human love, but the love of God. See, it's only understood when you and I attempt to grasp the life of the Trinity. What is life in the Trinity like? Well, it's amazing when you look at the pages of Scripture, what you discover. The Trinity, they're a mutual admiration society. Jesus said, I don't do anything. Unless I first see the Father do it. It's the Father that in that's Father that within me. He does the works. And then the Father, in that end, says, when Jesus comes out of the waters of baptism, the Father says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. He doesn't say, listen to me also. He says, listen to Him. The Father exalts Jesus and gives Him a name above every name. That would mean God's own name himself. Therefore, Jesus, there's this admiration. And then the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God comes. He comes to glorify Christ. The Bible says of the Holy Spirit that he will not speak of himself, but what he hears, that will he speak. It's so amazing that the Trinity is constantly deferring and pointing to the other and saying, look at him, listen to him. And they're so in love. They're so in delight. They're so enamored with one another that they seek to lift up, to build up, to encourage, to support the other. And they're constantly pointing at the other. And the other is pointing at them. There is this absolute giving in that end. Listen to this. Miroslav Volk. He's a, he's a, he's a uh, uh, theologian. He said this. The life of God is a life of selfless giving and other receiving love. The term mutual indwelling, Jesus said the Father dwells in me and I dwell in me. Mutual indwelling, in Greek they attempted to put a word to define it. We get our English word from the Greek word, choreography. You ever see true choreography? Whether it's in break dancing, which I like, or if you know, if you synchronize swimming or ballet, or my wife loves the rockets. Do you ever see multiples absolutely synchronized in their dancing where you can look at one and you've seen them all? Because they're all doing the exact same thing. Unity, oneness. That's the dance of the Trinity. When you've seen one, you've seen them all. There is total. Because why? If you're taking notes with me, when you look at life in the Trinity, the first reality, as you discover, is this, is deference. Life in the Trinity is defined by what? 
It's defined by number one, deference. Deference, we well, say, well, that's not a word we use all that often, but it means to defer. It means to give somebody else the opportunity. And we struggle with that as humans, don't we? You know, it's my turn. No, I want to talk. But no, they're constantly deferring to one another. It's so beautiful when you watch the Holy Spirit. It's like if you were to draw a picture on a, on a chalkboard up here, a stick picture, and that's Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes behind the chalkboard, puts his hand around and points and says, look at him, look at him. And all the rest of them are saying, look at them, look at them. Deference. This absolute, it's almost, a, it's almost like a divine shyness. But shyness, not of timidity. Shyness, not of, well, I don't matter, I'm not important. No, it's the shyness of deference. It's humility personified. It's not important that you listen to me. Listen to him. And they're all doing it to one another. It's so awesome when you see that they have no other objective but to lift up support and to point to one another. That is Amazing. I tried to think of a human analogy to that end. Besides John the Baptist, when we read, John the Baptist said, listen, I must decrease and he must increase. John was constantly saying, no, 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 no. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the one. The one coming after me, he is greater than I. I'm not even worthy to undo his shoe latches. That's a biblical example, but I thought of it, I, I was trying to think of an, an illustration, you know, naturally speaking, you know, like Cyrano de Bergiac, the guy that, you know, made the other guy look good with his words. But I thought of a modern illustration from a movie. I don't know if anybody ever saw it, but the movie Bagger Vance. This guy had gone to war, was a great golfer, came back. He lost his game. He lost his life. He lost his girl. He was washed up. And a guy came along called Bagger Vance, and he became his caddy. And basically, he gave himself, and he totally served this man and helped him to get his life back, his game back, and ultimately his girl back, and he left. And the reality of it is, how often do we see in life someone so willing to play a role that lifts up someone else and has no absolute desire to have any attention, credit, or all? If you can even begin, because it's so hard in the human mind to conceive that, because we're so needy. We want attention. It's so hard for us, but when we are truly mature in God's love, we're so full that we aren't defined by what other people think of us. We're defined by how much of the love of God we have we can give away, because we are complete in him. You understand that? That's where maturity as a body comes about when we begin to give and receive this love. So life in the Trinity is shown by deference. Number two, it's by admiration. Admiration. They're constantly building one another up. Constantly. Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. The Holy Spirit, you ever notice this? Amazing. How the Father and the Son built up the Holy Spirit. They said, you know what? All forms of sin can be, given, can be forgiven against the Father and against the Son. But sin against the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness for. Because the Holy Trinity is so into one another. So in love with one another, they're not going to let anybody be taken for granted. So there's an admiration, and thirdly, there is a selfless giving. Selfless giving. That's what the Trinity is about. In fact, look at these words from, from Neil Paglienta. He's, a, he's a, 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 a doctor of divinity in a Bible school. He said, listen, he said, at the center of the universe is a self-giving love. That is dynamic currency of the Trinitarian life of God, goes on to say. And the persons within, the, within God exalt each other, commune with each other, defer to each other. Each person, so to speak, makes room for the other two. See, true love, when you see it in that end, when you see an awesome marriage and the two parties are totally building one another up, when you see real friends that are built on respect and admiration, and honesty for those ends. There's something in us that we need to recognize. Listen, God loved community so much. It was so huge to him that he created a big world full of people to share it with. That's the heart of God because there is a love that can be experienced because man was made in the image and the likeness of God. See, God said, let us see the Trinity 
was involved in humanity. In fact, to understand the Trinity, man is spirit, soul, and body, but yet one man. But listen, God said, let us make man in our image. And we talked about this last week, that when God created man, he took a step back and said, listen, alone is not good. And he made another to experience life with. And here's what the scripture says. That therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two would become what? One flesh. Oneness was the means and desire of God that we could experience a love that makes two one because three have been one for all eternity. So it was possible. A union formed by love could make two one. In fact, Shakespeare caught this end. Listen to this. William Shakespeare, in his, in his poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle, he said this, So they loved, as love in twain, had the essence but in one. Two distincts, division none, number there in love was slain. Now I can understand, a lot of people's eyes are glazing over right now, going, what? Poetry? All the guys are going, oh my God, no, I'm fully living college again. Listen. But let me hear what they caught, because William Shakespeare caught a hold of this. He said, love and twain, two distincts, two different people, coming to form a love together, had the essence of but one. Number in their love was slain. Division none, number no more. Two becoming one is the heart dream. Of humanity. See, in God's heart, three were one. God designed that humanity would be, and the church, God designed that would be many parts, but would work as one. Oneness. In fact, if you're taking notes, listen. Community, divine community, is characterized by oneness. Divine community was characterized by oneness because God's math, according to God, in God's arithmetic scale, everything equals one. No matter how many, God works to bring all things to equal one. That's what God has been after. That's what God has been working on. That's what love, the love of God, works to achieve. One with one another. One with God and one with one another. Without God, it's an imperfect circle and generally doesn't work. And we end up hurting one another. But in God, there is this idea that we can form a oneness. In fact, look, in, look at this in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul gave this understanding. I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible. But listen to what the instructions to followers of Christ were. You were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction. Were we not? So stay together. Why did he have to say that? Because we still have a tendency. We're at work. It's still happening. God is still working on us. And we need to be encouraged. Stay together. Because naturally speaking, we allow ourselves to stray, to drift, or to just plain leave. Stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. In other words, don't just stay there in body. Stay there in heart. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. In other words, God is working this process. We need to yield to him and not to the desires of our flesh, not to our earthly nature, but to allow God to do what only God can because those times that become most challenging can be the perfecting unity of love working out in us things that could never otherwise be done because look at what he goes on to say as he ends this verse. He says this, next part. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. That's what the design, that's what the plan, that's what God works so hard at. To understand, when you and I work to build community, we work to honor the Trinity. When you and I begin to work together as one, we honor the God who gave everything. Because listen, that was Jesus' prayer. That's what Jesus designed. That's what Jesus desired. In fact, look at this. Go back to what he prayed again. The last piece is so important. In John 17, 21, this last verse, he said, May they also be in us. 
so that the world may believe. Do you realize what's at stake? Jesus was praying that this community, that this fellowship, that this community by design, one established in love, oneness with God and one another, he said that they would also, that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, let that sink in for a moment. That's our greatest apologetic. That's our greatest proof that God sent Jesus, that we who can be so ornery, we who can be so touchy, so easily offended, that we would allow the love of God to work in us to create such a unity, such a mutually satisfying and fulfilling community of people that it would create the thirst of the world around us to want in, to be a part of it, to recognize God has to be in that. God has to be a part of that because that doesn't happen like that. Anywhere else I see that there is a love, a loyalty, a devotion among the heart of the people that are following that when there's a community marked in that fashion, that it creates in others a design and a desire. Because listen, it was not Jesus' wishful thought. It was his ultimate desire when he prayed. And he and the Trinity themselves gave everything for this to be possible. Jesus gave his life. He sacrificed. He died. He paid the ultimate price. The Father gave and allowed his Son to go through the most intense agony. If you're a parent, you realize this. When you watch your children suffer, you wish you could exchange places with them. Do you think that the Father in heaven didn't think anything different on that time? They all sacrificed. In fact, the Holy Spirit sacrificed that he was willing to leave heaven and live here on earth inside of human beings that would grieve him, that would ignore him, that would quench him, and allow human beings to treat him so badly, but yet he's committed because his love is to make this possible. This is the dream of God. And if this is the heart of God, should we not fight for community? Should we not be about doing everything in our power to make this a possibility? Because when we are a community by design, listen, when we are a community that's distinguished, experiencing divine community is to know that, listen, number one, the joy of belonging. Don't we all want to belong? Don't we all want to know, want to go somewhere where everybody knows your name? Yeah, we got the right spirit in this place. Okay, listen, the joy of belonging, when you know, and that should be what the church is about, because guess what? None of us deserve to be here. Nobody earned their way in. We were all undeserving. We heard a good news message that grace was extended, that God loved us despite our failures, despite our shortcomings, and he accepted us in the beloved. Why should we not readily be accepting all who walk in the door because God took us with all our flaws, with all our failures, with all our shortcomings and he didn't kick us to the curb and say wait till you get your act together. Why would we as human beings ever treat other people in that way? That's not what the church was intended by God to be. We should be about the joy of making others know they belong, that they are deserved to be here because why none of us deserved it God freely gave it and what we have freely received we should be freely willing to give listen the joy of belonging secondly the delight of being known and loved that means you know what we need to go out of our way learn people's names hear their stories one of the things I love when we do small group Cal and I in our home when you hear the stories of other people Every time I walk away listening to somebody's story, it always makes me love and respect them more than I thought I did before. When I realize the challenges they've come through in life, the difficulties they've encountered, you begin to recognize you can delight in being known and loved. That's our challenge. See, you're sitting waiting for somebody else to do it to you. Why don't you go out of your way and allow it to be, hey, I don't know your name. Can you tell me your name? Can we have a cup of coffee? Can we talk for a moment? and get to know somebody, and then remember it next week? Oh, wow, now you're asking a lot, Pastor Ken. (laughs) Write it on your hand. Hopefully write it on your heart. But listen, go out of your way. Get to know other people. Know their name. And love people. Thirdly, thirdly, listen, 
opportunity of giving and growing. Because when we give and extend ourselves, we grow. And we have opportunity. That's why you can serve on the dream team. That's why you can do outreach. All these opportunities right here at church, you can serve others. Because love grows when it's given away. I know that doesn't seem intuitive. But it is true that the more you exercise, the more you give, the more you receive. And the more you give of God's love, the more God's love grows inside of you. It doesn't matter how it's received by the people that you're giving it to. When you're willing for God's sake to give it, it grows in you. And so we grow in those opportunities. And lastly, listen, the safety of finding a true home. Isn't that what everybody wants? That's what the house of God was intended. That's why the church, one of the names was called the house of God. Not ain't the building. It's the realization that you were welcome into the family of God. God went out of his way. He opened the door wide. He's welcomed the whole world to come in. And as many as received him, Jesus, to those he gives the right, the privilege, and the power to become children of God. The fact is God has made the opportunity available. There's a place to come home to. God has been calling. God has been inviting. God has been seeking and hopefully you've been working with them and inviting them to come because they're welcome. There's a place, there's a safety to know that there's a true home that you and I belong in and it's available to whosoever will. So listen to me as we close. Listen. Are you working to keep unity? Are you working to build community? Are you sitting back? Are you waiting for someone else? Or are you cooperating with God? God gave everything. This is the heart of God. We honor God. We honor the Trinity when we go out of our way to be one with God's desire. Oneness with him and oneness with one another. You can't have it one way. It's not one with God and forget everybody else. Because selfish love corrupts. But when you become so secure in the love of God and who you are to God, you can't extend yourself. Because hurting people, yes, sometimes hurt others, but you can be a part of that healing process. That you can grow a little, mature a little, love a little bit more than is convenient to love. And go out of your way to extend and watch healing, watch power, watch God. As it says, one of my favorite Broadway uh, shows of all time, Les Miserables, there's a line in it that says, To love someone is to see the face of God. If God, and he is, is love, then every time you extend love, you see God in action. Every time you yield to love, you're allowing God to work in you. Every time when you're willing to work for community, when you're willing to give yourself, here it is, my friends, it's possible. Do you think Jesus would pray for something that was impossible to happen? What's impossible with man is in truth possible with God. We can be distinguished as a community like that. We can become a community by design. We can allow relationships and community to form that are not shallow, that are not inconsequential, that are not just surface level. We can allow true community to build meaningful relationships where we give and receive oneness with God and one another. It's possible. So how about it? Let's make it happen. Let's let Vertical Church be a place that's distinguished as Jesus said it should be. That those people over there, they love one another. And when you go over there, they make you feel like they're, you're a part of that community. They make you feel like even though I've been far away, I belong. I should be there. What happens, my friends, if you and I were to have the courage to venture out and allow that to be our number one focus. Number one, you'd be in the heart of God. You'd be in sync with your Father in heaven. You would honor the Trinity, but guess what, my friends? This is so powerful. We would be communicating to a world that desperately needs Jesus, that Jesus is the answer for society. They will know that the Father sent Jesus. How? By the love and unity and community that we allow God to form in our midst. There's no more important matter we could be about than that. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me pray for us today. Father, give us the courage and the boldness today. Do not go away from this message and go, that was nice, let's move on to something else. 
but let our hearts grasp the importance of this. Let us hear the voice of Jesus in his prayer, his desperate cry that we would be one and experience the quality of relationship with one another. That Father, that you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have been experiencing for all eternity. Lord, it is possible. You've made it. You've allowed the love of God to be shed abroad in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Maybe we'd be willing to yield. Maybe we'd be willing to give of ourselves. Maybe we go out of our comfort zones and reach out and begin to build and form community. Meet others, love others, serve others, care about others. Learn their names. Learn their stories. Begin to become one as you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. My prayer today, Lord, is in harmony with Jesus' prayer. That we would be that people on the earth that have expressed you for all eternity. Almighty God, let it be so. In Jesus' name.